Welcome everybody. It's an honor to be able to moderate this next panel. And this next panel is part of a series of talks called Leaps Talks. Now, for those of you who were with us in 2020, we had some really interesting Leaps Talks that we coordinated between people like George Church, Tristan Harris from The Social Dilemma, D.A. Wallach. So some really innovative people speaking about innovative topics, but not just about the science and technology, because Leaps Talks are looking at the ethics of these technologies as they come to market. And that's what we're going to be talking about today in terms of culture and cultured meat. Is the world ready for sell to table? We partner with Leaps by Bayer, which is the strategic impact investment unit of Bayer, and it brings a fresh perspective to Symbio Beta and to Built with Biology. Leaps has invested over $1.5 billion in over 50 companies in health and agriculture, and many of them are here today. If you appreciate their unique investment approach, then I encourage you to connect with them. You've probably seen the Leaps by Bayer Lounge out in the courtyard. Bayer, just a couple of weeks ago, announced an additional $1.5 billion through their Leaps team. So the team is gonna be very busy over the next few years. And to tell you more about it, I'd like to welcome my good friend and the head of Leaps by Bayer, Jürgen Eckhart. Thank you, John, and uh, thank you, Sinbaya Beda. It's a great honor to be here with all these um, great scientists, uh, entrepreneurs, and uh, innovators poised to change the world for the better. As cultivated meat moves closer to our dinner plates, the question is, are eaters ready for this? I'm personally uh, convinced uh, or very optimistic that uh, this innovation will be beneficial for both the health of our planet and the people. And one in five people on this world die because of uh, bad nutrition, which is exactly why providing a sustainable alternative protein supply is one of the 10 big challenges or leaps, as we call them, that we're trying to address at uh, Leaps by Bayer. It's also at the heart of our investment into New York-based uh, Fork and Good. And it's a great pleasure that Nia Gupta, the co-founder and CEO of Fork and Good, is about to join us on stage. I'm also grateful that uh, Chef JJ Johnson and Amy Webb will be sharing their perspective on the future of food and culture. Thanks again, John, for leading the discussion. And I look forward to uh, an interesting uh, 20 minutes. Thank you, Jörg. So let's now bring to the stage Nia Gupta from Fork and Good, Chef JJ Thompson, and Amy Webb. Um, Nia is the CEO and the co founder of Fork and Good. And Fork and Good aims to produce delicious meat in a sustainable manner without killing the animals. Nia spent over 10 years in the food and ag business, including at McKinsey and Syngenta. She's also had her stint as an entrepreneur, launching a profitable food brand, and she formerly, formerly ran an urban farming company. She has an MBA and a master's in public administration in international development from Harvard and an economics BA from Yale. Chef JJ Johnson, award-winning chef from New York, uh, from Pennsylvania, now in New York, um, founder, TV personality, and author, JJ presents an environment for connection through food that transcends people, memories, and generations. He is the James Beard Award winner for Best Author, nominee for Best Chef, and rising star New York City, Forbes, and Zagat 30 Under 30, and two-time Best New Restaurant of the Year winner by Esquire magazine. JJ combines culturally relevant ingredients with classical techniques at Field Trip, his quick casual rice bowl shop that highlights the future of food. And in preparation for this uh, panel, I've been, uh, I've been doing some uh, Googling of, uh, of Field Trip, and it's definitely where I want to go next time I'm, uh, I'm in New York, all three of them. Uh, Amy Webb is a quantitative futurist. She has studied game theory, economics, statistics, political science, computer science, sociology, music, and journalism. 
She has a new book out, The Genesis Machine, which many of you have uh, have read. Uh, she thinks uh, the synthetic buzz is the most synthetic the most important technology of our lifetime. She's also a professor at NYU Stern School of Business. She develops and teaches an MBA on strategic foresight and future forecasting. And she's the founder of the Future Today Institute. Let's give another big round of applause for our three panelists today. So we're talking about the culture of cultured meat. Is the world ready for sell to table? Before we talk about whether the world is ready for this. Um, Nia, I want to ask you, uh, wh why do this in the first place? You know, what's wrong with the agricultural system that we have right now? So as you were talking about earlier, John, I spent close to 15 years in conventional agriculture. And it was super fulfilling. And all the work I was doing was around essentially making more productive supply chains. And I got to a point where we were basically helping Nigeria build factory farms and feedlots. And I felt really conflicted about that because of course we want more meat. We all want more meat, particularly people in parts of the world coming out of poverty. The first thing they do is eat more meat and move out of staples and eat more produce. But I'm also importing along with that productivity, problems with fecal runoff, problems with pathogen spread, problems like before we even get to environmental and animal welfare issues, we're talking about huge issues with just the immediate supply chain and meat. And that got me really interested in innovation. So are there other models to meet this demand of this, this food that we just love so much that are safer and aren't as destructive to the environment or our health? So the technology that Fork and Good has developed is cell-based agriculture. So it's taking uh, not stem cells, but uh, but fat cells, meat cells, meat cells from a pig. Mm -hmm. And tell us a little bit more about, about what goes on to make sure that everybody's on the same page of what Fork and Good does. Sure. So we are using a non-harmful cultivation process. So usually not everybody knows what that is, but I think at this conference, a few more people have been talking about it and do know what that is. But just so that we're all on the same page, we take real cells, so meat cells, um, muscle cells, and fat cells. That goes, that's what goes into meat. And then we tend to them and nurture them and grow them up and harvest that to then make meat products. So we're not growing like whole parts of animals, but we're not using another chemical compound or using any kind of plants. We're just growing real meat cells. And I think that this industry has actually been around a long time. So our like team came up with the first prototypes of cultivated meat a decade ago. So we proved that it tasted good and we proved that it was the same exact nutrition. A muscle cell is a muscle cell. The problem was it was really not scalable. So the reason we came back together to do Fork and Good was that we developed a protected process to grow these cells in incredibly high yields. So be able to grow enough of these cells in a small enough space to be more efficient than meat. So I really think of this almost like the hydroponics for meat, like a better way of growing meat. And we'll come back to the economics and the sustainability shortly. Um, but Amy, I'd like to bring you in because I want you to talk a little bit about the background that you've had in agriculture and then a little bit about the process that you go through. Um, because we talked earlier and, and you were keen to separate futurism from future forecasting, one being more of a quantitative uh, science, which is, I think, what you're, what you're practicing. Um, yeah, so very briefly, um, what, what I do in strategic foresight, what my company does, is uh, use data to build models to determine signals and what we would call longitudinal trends. So these are the big forces of change that impact different industries. And then we use that to model scenarios. Um, and the point of this isn't to make predictions because the math doesn't work out. It's to make preparations. Every investor, every CEO, all they want to know is the executive teams want to want to know where to place their big bets. They want to reduce uncertainty. Um, so that's what we do. And then for management teams below them, they need lots of new ideas. So we help them drastically expand their thinking on what's recently plausible. Um, and for the executive teams, we help them narrow down so that they can make decisions. Now, um, we actually had a huge argument at lunch. Uh, so so the, the, the through line, we all hung out together. We all went out to lunch. 
we got into like a, like we kind of argued, but it was also kind of fun um, about the futures of all of this stuff. And what set off part of that argument was, wasn't really an argument argument, but um, so I, some of you may not know this, but in February, there's this thing that happens in the United States where um, the entire country shuts down and people watch um, the guy carry the, the ball down the field to get the points. <laughs> And football, then football? Some, something, something, yeah, like some that. of it. But then, like everybody else, is constitutionally obligated to eat chicken wings. And in February of this year, Americans ate 1.45 billion with a B chicken wings, which required 750 million chickens. Now, that's on a single day. So, to need, so like what you were just talking about, you know, the the demand, the need. We don't necessarily have an immediate present day need. I mean, some places do, but we are absolutely going to have a longer term need because we've got geopolitical instability. We have extreme volatility in supply chain uh, economics, and we've got, you know, like a climate problem. And so all of these things introduce an enormous amount of uncertainty into the cultivation, production, distribution um, of meat. And those are addressable problems through a different process. Um, and then you were telling us, because this is kind of a crazy story, so I had the, the chicken wing thing. You were talking about, well, then we argued about whether or not anybody would eat the chicken wings, and you could even make chicken wings. But tell everybody about your, um, your thing oh, yeah, at the Open. The, the, the U.S. Open tennis tournament. Where you have an awesome restaurant. I have a restaurant at U.S. Open t- tennis tournament three weeks in Queens, New York. Uh, for all you tennis fans out there, make sure you come see us. There's one uh, tennis fan. One person <laughs> clapped. Um, I think there's a, a crazy statistic is like 20 tons of lobster tails, uh, 100,000 pieces of jumbo shrimp eaten over three weeks. Uh, so I think when, 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 we were, when, we, when you were saying this, I was like, hold on. Sporting arenas are just chicken tenders, chicken fingers. How many of those are produced? How much of that are we eating? It had my brain really yeah. spinning for a moment of like, who are the chicken farmers and what are they feeding their chickens? Yeah, and our, well, then we were talking about the chickens themselves because like a hundred years ago, chickens were, you know, like a one and a half. You said one and a half pounds. Kilograms, I, right? And I say I don't. I don't buy a chicken larger than two and a half pounds. So everybody in the audience that's buying four pound chickens, stop buying four pound chickens. Ask your butcher to give you a two pound chicken or two and a half pound chicken because- But those are hard to find because they're all pumped full of hormones and antibiotics lot, yeah, yeah. and yeah, anyhow. So JJ, let's talk about your kitchen for a second. Um, let's talk about meat in particular. What sets it apart from the other flavors and what makes it unique to cook with compared to say plant-based proteins? Got when it. you're setting your menu, maybe you could give us a sense of what is on your menu. How are you deciding about your choice of protein? So, so for me, Field Trip is a rice bowl shop. Uh, everything on the menu is under $13. Uh, the, the goal of Field Trip is to give the everyday person a consciously better way to eat in communities that don't have that, right? So the first location was in Harlem in a corridor that has one of the highest unemployment rates in New York City that's surrounded by all of our favorite fast food chains, right? But in most of our communities where we live, we have a choice. We can eat fried chicken. We can eat, you know, frozen beef, or we can go eat a salad. Uh, but in communities like Harlem, Detroit, Oakland, they don't they don't have that option. So that was the ultimate goal. And how I build the menu is a little bit different than most chefs build menus. I build a menu based off of people and places uh, and inspiration. So I cooked in Ghana one point in my career. Realized I was a kid of the African diaspora. And I started using the encyclopedia to tell me uh, how people moved and why they moved and how they went there and then the food that came out of that. <laughs> so a dish that's on uh, the menu at Field Trip, um, John, you appreciate this, right? I have pineapple black fried rice, inspiration from my time I spent in Singapore. It comes with salmon, peri-peri salmon, peri-peri sauce that you would see in West Africa, but very similar to like Singaporean uh, chili crab. Um, and that's the flavors that come together. So when I'm thinking about food, I'm thinking about people and places and culture and how that can make up the, the mash of a dish and then how that relates to, to people when they walk through the doors. Um, 
I think now I think about it a little bit different with supply chain. Chicken was 44 cents a pound before the pandemic. It's $120 a pound that wow. I'm purchasing it right now. That's what, 2X, 3X? Um, so protein and meat is a player, but can I take the salmon off the menu that jumped up a dollar? I'm scared as a, as, a, as a business owner. If I take that off the menu and I change it, will people stop coming through the doors? And we'll come to supply chains uh, in a second. We've actually got a, a video of something that happened a couple of weeks ago, which is you <laughs> trying the fucking good uh, meat. So I did. Uh, now, this is the first time I'm seeing this video, so I hope <laughs> I... Wait, I wait, you need to set it up, though, because you should set up the video and explain what, this, what happened. Oh, so when we found out we were on this panel together, I, I showed up with some dumplings. And um, Chef JJ tried them, and it was, it was completely unplanned. And this, this was literally just our teammate Sasha on her iPhone, so it's very unprofessional. I said, can, <laughs> I, I said, can I cook it the way I want to cook it? Can I do what I want to do? Yeah, yeah. And he was like, no, you got to make pot stickers first, and then you can do whatever you want to do. But it, it, you know, it was my first time, not my first time t tasting uh, cultured. cultured meat or any culture product, I've actually invested in the space. Um, but it was very uh, interesting moment and it was good. That's impressive. That's amazing. I wouldn't know that you grew it. I wouldn't know it at all. Congratulations. Let, let's just uh, let's just give a round of applause here. So, so what was your first impression? Uh, when did you first come across cultured meat? Um, you know, it sounds like a couple of years ago, but what was your first impression of it? Uh, when somebody emailed me and said I've I've cultured meat, I said, "Woo, what's going what's going on?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, because you know, I think everybody just started getting comfortable with plant based, right? We just started getting comfortable with Impossible and Beyond, right? We just started learning about it. Then it was like, now it's like, okay, now we have like, and, and first it wasn't cultured, right? People were emailing, I'm growing this in a lab. Uh, or I'm, grow I'm growing salmon in a beer vessel, right? Um, but I think all chefs are always intrigued about flavor, about texture, and we've seen you know, farm-raised salmon, we've seen that movement. We've seen farm-raised shrimp, we've seen that movement. We had to, we had to get uh, comfortable with that, right? So I look at this as the same way, um, can but you, it was can shocking. Can I ask you a question? So you're a media person, right? So the word cultured meat, is that, is that a delectable, I mean, it's like, does that work? I don't know, I've been throwing it around a lot, like, yo, sitting on this panel about cultured meat. They're like, what are you talking about, JJ? <laughs> cultured meat? I feel that's better than lab-grown meat, though, right? Way better than lab-grown meat. Because we don't say, meat. like, yeah, no. well, today we get with the chicken, <laughs> those huge chickens, we don't, you know, they're, they're full of hormones. They're grown in, they may be free-ranging, but there's nowhere for them to range to in a commercial warehouse. They're pumped full of all different, we don't, we just, we don't call it, like, like a uh, hormone antibiotic pump full of can't really roam around warehouse commercial chickens. We just call them chickens. Correct. Right? So maybe we just... And that's kind of what you were saying at lunch because I was asking, you've tried these different alternatives. You've tried plant... And, I, and I'm not an absolutist. I think we'll still have animal agriculture. We'll need plant-based proteins. I've seen so many cool things with microbes. Like there's room for all of these choices. But I was asking for you, like, you've been pitched all these things and you've tried all these things. Yeah, like, I mean, why from, is this different? Like, why? This why? is different because you've asked, like, the first question I asked you is, okay, so where's your hog from? You're like Berkshire. I was like, okay, that's legit. That's like the creme of the creme. That's Wagyu beef, <laughs> right? Um, but that also matters, right? From a sourcing perspective, from a taste perspective, from a due that, diligence. It is. But I get, but these people call me, I got chicken. Like, you don't, you're not, you're not plant-based chicken. That's not chicken. You might've figured out how to make it taste like chicken, but that's not chicken, right? That's totally different than what you're doing or the research that you do or how, you know, mm -hmm. this is a totally different game. Why I said, I look at it as like farm-raised salmon, farm-raised shrimp. Mm -hmm. I don't look at it as like pounding uh, antibiotics into birds and yeah. animals to make sure they're four pounds in the grocery store.
JJ, I think what you're touching on really at its core is trust. Do you trust your supply chain? Do you trust the person who's producing the meat? Do you trust the person who's selling you the meat? What can we do to increase trust and transparency in supply chains? Nia? Now, as, as you were speaking, I was thinking about um, the hydroponics analogy I was using earlier. Like, So we've had hydroponics here for years, decades now, but in other parts of the world, we're still introducing it. Um, and I've seen it be introduced in very rural areas and people be worried about it. You know, it, will these vegetables have the same nutrition? Um, are, you know, in parts of rural India, I've seen people say, will they just be full of water? You know, and because the nutrition is supposed to come from the soil. So it's that level of education and understanding that really needs to happen. And I think right now we've been talking a lot about the technology and what we haven't really been talking about is how to really be super clear to the consumer of what this is. And, and that's what builds trust, right, is that level of transparency and education. So 10 years ago, I was putting in my newsletter about uh, Modern Meadow, the first uh, or one of the first uh, cell-based ag companies. Now they've pivoted into just materials and leather, but at the time, um, Andres Forgax, who I think is here at the meeting, was deciding whether he was going to be doing leather or he was going to be doing food. And so I, we sent out in my newsletter about this uh, investment in, uh, in Modern Meadow. And I got, my mom is on my newsletter, as many of you know. And uh, I got one word email back from my mom, and it was yuck. And I've told this story a few times over the years. And I thought, but you know what? That was 10 years ago now. I wonder what my mom thinks now. So I, so I, uh, I text her yesterday. Um, and, I, and I asked her, hey, have you, have you heard about this? What do you think? And, uh, and I, actually, I didn't text her. I sent her a voice memo. And I'm going to read the full thing in my mom's uh, voice. John, I've told you before, my mom is a little bit deaf. John, I've told you before that I can't hear your messages clearly. <laughs> <laughs> I am told, this is my dad now telling my mom, I'm sure. I am told you want to know if I would eat cultured meat. I would taste it and then decide, same as anything else new. Love, Mal. <laughs> so I think that's a decadal uh, change in the mind there. But I don't mean to be a, a wet blanket on this, but when we're talking about this, so we had an awesome meal for lunch. And we brought it up to the chef, and she didn't look as enthusiastic. She did not. She didn't dismiss us, right? But she also wasn't, she, you know, she was sort of politely saying, yeah, that sounds great. I can't wait. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I mean, I think part of this is scientists need to do, researchers need to do a much better job being comfortable talking about their work in a way that people, normal people can understand which is fine. You have to assume, for those of you who are scientists, that journalists are just scouring the abstracts at this point and turning that into news. And, you know, there's a lot that gets missed. Um, and then, you know, from a company perspective, there's a lot that's interesting here. And one of the things I always ask is, if this succeeds, who fails? And um, while there's a ton of opportunity, all of this implies a lot of change. And trust and change go hand in hand. You ever notice that we don't have chief change officers? We have chief innovation officers. Because innovation is more palatable than change. So this is a long horizon tech, but we have to get people used to thinking differently and getting educated on this. I want to tell everybody that we're actually throwing this open to questions. So if you want to tweet a question at any of the panelists, then you can use the hashtag built with bio and by the magic of the internet, so I will get a text message with the, uh, <laughs> with the tweets on them. Um, so I know this is a topic of interest to many people, so I hope that you'll uh, give us some uh, interesting questions for the panelists. Let's jump back to the, um, to the core claims about sustainability and the core claims about uh, the economics of this working out, because that's why it's been a 10-year process to see it happen. And now uh, we, we can't keep track of the number of cell-based ag companies out there. Every man and his dog literally uh, has a, has a cell-based ag company. Um, so Nia, uh, you were 
from a hardcore quantitative background at McKinsey. Um, tell us about the, the, your transformation because you were very skeptical about this when you first came across it. Yeah, so you, you were telling the story of like the Four Gatches and Modern Meadow, which was the, the first cultured meat company, and they had completely stopped doing meat. Um, so they created the first prototypes in 2011. By 2014, they were done, all leather. Uh, but people still had so much passion for this because what we've highlighted is the issues in the industry. And they felt like this could really be a solution. So there was all this excitement and passion, and they had some of like the original thinking, the original patents, proved the product, proved the nutrition, could not get it to scale, could not get it cheap enough. And just came to me sort of as an ag expert and just asked, what do you think? Like, we've been thinking about science all this time, but we've never really spoken to anyone in agriculture. What do you think? And I came at it really thinking like a farmer and thinking about feed conversion and what we use animals for, which is just stuffing them full of carbohydrates and getting them to grow bioavailable protein. And that's all we look at in yield for livestock. And compare that to cultured meat, and the yields were miserable. I was like, I don't understand why anyone's pursuing this at all. You know, and I told them, do not license your patents, do not get into the sector, like, you know, basically don't pass go, like just like drop the whole thing, right? It was extremely skeptical. Um, Gabor, my co-founder and, and partner, my scientific partner, is so passionate about the space. It's been 25 years just kept bothering me. I mean, I was running a farm in Singapore like for years, just bothering me and bothering me and coming up with ways to strip out costs from this like tissue engineering process. And it was still not cheap enough. It was really, really expensive. And when I explained to him like what we needed in terms of feed conversion and yield and just what it would cost to do like one of these factories and how much meat we would need to grow in sort of tons to make this work, I think that's sort of like when the penny dropped and like the backward solving for him to come up with like essentially a, a new process that we've patented, which allows us to grow a lot of muscle cells in a small space and brings down the cost by two magnitudes. That's the only thing that got us excited to start this again. Um, so once we co-authored that invention, they convinced me to move over here and you know start working good. But it's, it's still, a pro I think it's a problem now that everyone is solving, right? I don't, I don't think the question for cultivated meat now is, does this taste good? Can this work? Can this be a compelling product or nutrition? The question now is, can we actually make enough of this cheaply? So that's what we're squarely focused on. Can and you get people to buy it, though? Well, to that, I would say, like, all the research we've done is there's going to be, like, 10 or 15% of people who are, like, you're messing with nature, not for me, right? I need a brain, I need consciousness with my animal. There's gonna be another 10 or 15% who are like avid supporters, we're like, I've been waiting for this my whole life, particularly younger generation, like I don't wanna kill animals, I feel deeply conflicted about this. But then like the bulk of us are somewhere in the middle. We want proof that it's safe, <laughs> proof that it's yummy, and proof that it's affordable, you know? and. I'm sure you would feel differently about it if I was just describing it to you on a phone call versus when you just ate the dump. No, no, yeah, right? no, listen, right. I think I think all, all those things you hit are, are key. Yeah. Uh, but and, trust is, trust is the, I think trust is, for me, uh, when I look at people that walk through the doors in a restaurant, like when I opened in Harlem, I, I had to get trust from the consumer just to come in and buy a rice bowl. Mm -hmm. Very familiar ingredient. Now it's like, well, you, you guys have a lot of work, a lot yeah. of education, 100%. And, and, a, and a lot of trust. But what gives me hope is that we're kind of starting off from a place of transparency. Because when, when I think about what's compared to us, right? Compared to us is regular meat, which is completely non-transparent. I think, to me, this is not a matter of if, or even if consumers, but we're facing as existential crises. And if we want to continue to consume protein, right, meat, mm. we need other alternatives because there's too much variability, mm. which means the economics long term don't work out. And there's a hidden opportunity here. I mean, we were talking over lunch. You know, it is mind bending. Like the most mind bending thing is not the, the dumpling. <laughs> Um, that exists. It's the fact that Singapore may no longer need to import meat full stop, right? And that, that you know, 
Singapore is a cosmopolitan, gorgeous place that doesn't, they can't exactly raise 750 million chickens, right? <laughs> For consumption on a single day. A, a place like Singapore could produce the meat, all of the meat that it needs in a, a handful of buildings. But can everybody afford it that lives in Singapore? Well, that's the question. And right now, right. So right this now, is like- no, and that's right. where we have, like, so if you, and I would go back to your sustainability point, because if you're, that much more expensive, I would question also if you're that much more sustainable, right? Because what about meat makes it unsustainable? So with pigs and cows, there's like 25% farting, um, but then there's like a 30, 35% of just feedstock, so feedstock processing, and then there's supply chain. Right, but that's right. today. We already know that because of Russia, we've got a long-term fertilizer problem, right? I mean, we, we have these long-term problems now so, to, so it, I don't know what the portion but price do you, is. But I see it as this. I see like uh, traditional, I call it traditional, like old school farming as one sector, mm -hmm. grass-fed beef, mm -hmm. right? That's one sector that took a long time to come back on the market. Like people like grass-fed beef, what's this? Most countries all eat grass-fed beef, right? And then I see cult cultivation of, of meat as another sector. Mm -hmm. And that's the two things you'll choose, for me in the future, those are yes. the two things you'll choose. Right, it's optionality. Can, it's yeah. optionality, which we don't have now. We don't. But don't have you options. still need the Berkshire pork? You, you, that can't become extinct because then you guys don't exist. Well, I don't know. Is that we? So you, you wouldn't necessarily need it, right? But I, I think we're so so far away from being able to reproduce wagyu, right? Because like, of the unique marbling texture. Yeah, all of that, right? Like, Honestly, I, I don't know why. I lived in Japan for like <laughs> almost a decade. I don't get outside of Japan's obsession with Wagyu. Right. It's but, but what I'm it's saying delicious. Is, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what are you talking about? I don't really it's eat like meat, so like, I don't know that I'm, yeah, the I don't, fat I don't get it. melts in your hand. <laughs> you can slice it thin. I mean, like, there's so much. Okay, so like. And they take care of the cattle extremely well. Okay, well, I mean, so unless Wagyu. You, unless, I don't know, maybe they're lying I, to I us. I feel you, I feel you. No, they're they're awesome. They massage them, and it's very <laughs> Japanese. But, but, but wait, but like Wagyu today, why couldn't there be something better than Wagyu tomorrow? That just is different. I mean, this is like we, we're using our con the constraints of today mm -hmm. to project out in the future, and I think that's where we're going to get stuck. There's, we we yeah. lock ourselves out of the opportunity. But there's kind of no free lunch, is what I'm saying, right? So if the problem you're trying to solve is this like feedstock conversion, and you're just trying to make the most efficient way of like getting animal protein, then solve that problem. You know, if you're also trying to do like the marbling, all of the cut, like trying to create the texture, that's really hard to scale, it's really expensive, and all of that translates to more energy as well. So you kind of have to be careful of like, what are you trying to solve? So that's why you started with ground pork? That's why we started with ground pork. Yeah. Why pork over chicken or something else? So it's the most commonly consumed- That makes sense. Yeah. Protein in the world, and where we see like, you know, huge increases in Southeast Asia and East yeah. Asia, that's where. And, oh, and the and African swine flu, you've got a pork population. That, you have yeah, yeah. a breed that's really sensitive to disease. Yeah. And that's I grew right. up in Hong Kong, so obviously, you know, dim sum. Uh, so, so, sorry, you're moderating us. <laughs> we'll listen to you now. <laughs> you know, we talk about food. We could talk about food all day. We can right. the three of us can <laughs> talk about food today. <laughs> we, <laughs> we barely got to order at lunch because we wouldn't stop talking. <laughs> we just all get so worked up about food. Sorry, John, we're listening to you now. <laughs> well, I'm curious, uh, just speaking of pork, uh, one of the other opportunities for cell-based ag is for Muslim cultures, for Jewish cultures. How does this work? What is the current... Come on, John, stop it, man. <laughs> They're going to get cells. She's getting cells from a Berkshire pork. She's growing in a, in in cultivation in a lab. It's pork. So in the moss next to field trip is not. If I put that on the menu, they're gonna shut me down. <laughs> they don't care. But the imams and the rabbis are actually split on this. You I realize. don't Because if your issue is cleanliness, then it's a super clean process. If your issue is humane killing, we're not killing anything. So I'm Jewish. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I mean, like, technically I qualify because my mother's Jewish, so it's in, I'm, I'm, this is all going horribly wrong. I'm Jewish, I'm very proud of that. Um, but I was going to talk about pork. Uh, so, right, so, like, I think the, the interpretation of, like, the laws of kashrut probably would allow me to eat the 
like y you could eat the dumplings. Mm -hmm. um, but I think hardliners are always going to do like strict interpretation. It's a small sliver of the addressable market. I, I wouldn't worry about it. So I guess what but, I'm but saying. This is where this is where I where I get a little torn because it's you. If you're coming on the market and you're saying you're pork, you gotta be pork. If you're coming on the market and you're saying you're chicken, you should be chicken. What do you call almond milk? I call almond milk a plant-based okay. milk. Okay. For me, right? It's not milk. Milk comes from a cow. You milk the cow, right? It might have the same consistency. They, but you know, they're still adding preservatives to that to get it to that. But it's viscous. so. But it, but it, but if if it's molecularly identical to pork, it was just never attached to a pig that had a heartbeat and breathed. Is it not pork? I don't know. You took the cells. I mean, it seems like it's pork, yeah? I, I, so that's for me from an educational standpoint. If this is the future and you're going to be pork and, and I can go and get pork now for 99 cents again. Yes. I don't know. I'm not putting a price tag on, on your stuff, but. We're, I we're aiming get it for, for about that. We're aiming 99 for 99 cents that. again. Yeah. And I'm telling everybody this is, I'm telling the chef in the restaurant, it's pork. It tastes good. Yeah, it might not have the same amount of fat, but it, it has the same type of moisture. But then you're like, well, you know. Jewish people are eating it now. Well, Jewish Muslim people wouldn't eat the people. pork anyways, whether or not it's Muslim but people are eating it now. Do you feel like as a chef you would have to disclose if it was cellular, if it was cultured versus? Of course you'd have oh, Well, that's to. a good question. No, I, you wouldn't no, I think, by regular, like unless the FDA says something. I, I think that, would you feel like you would have to disclose I that? think that's the levels to it, right? Like you were talking yeah, about yeah. Wagyu. So yeah. is it like 9, 10 score, 11, 12 score, like all these different things? I think... You'll, you, you'll probably graduate from culture and be called something else. Mm -hmm. It might be better than Berkshire or pork. It might have a name There's to it. There's your name. <laughs> right? name better than it. Berkshire. And that would, that's how it would live, and then that's how it would be described on a menu. Yeah. And I think that's I think that's what, for me, I would love to see it get to uh, because if it has the same moisture content, right. if it has the same flavor, can caramelize, can do all those things, why can't we call it pork? But what, what else can, what, but what can we call it? But initially, you know, going back to the trust piece, initially, I would want everyone to know exactly what they were eating, right? And that it was a new process and that it was approved by the yeah, US. Yeah, because the stakes but are then you too would high. just be there, maybe you would just be like Nyman Ranch, like no, no, you know, vegetarian fed, this and that. Maybe you listen and say, I don't know, grown in Jersey City. <laughs> Grown in Jersey City. Yeah, that's true. That's right? True. That's where our factory Grown is. Grown in NYU. Yeah. Let's but, do that. Let's do it. But to your point around yeah. like the classifications and everything, I, we can analyze it and be sort of logical about it. But the way people are is they they decide first and then they rationalize later. Right. We we um, unfortunately the stories that we make up in our heads are always more impactful than what what actually exists. So I mean, listen from my point of view, what you're working on solves it. It doesn't. The problem that it solves is that if we want to continue eating meat, there are crises, there are issues over which no one entity has total control. Um, that is climate change, that is geopolitical instability, and that is supply chain volatility. For, a, for the foreseeable future, none of those problems go away. And if we want to continue eating stuff, you guys want to have a, a rice argument? We shouldn't. But if we want to continue <laughs> eating things, um, we, we, if you're a human who likes to eat, we need to figure out other ways to get our food. And doing what you're doing introduces control into a highly volatile, highly um, unstable um, set of circumstances. So what if it doesn't like actually scale um, in a way that's economically viable for a couple of years? That's fine. We have a couple of years to go. But at some point, this becomes an inevitability from my vantage point. And for me, I think it's a reset of agriculture, right? America is built on agriculture. It's our strong, it's what makes us Americans who we are. Um, and at one point, or how the, how, the, how the world is divided, it's like, well, California will grow heirloom tomatoes, right? Or California will grow strawberries. And they're the only place that can grow it. But there's a guy in New Jersey that grows strawberries and they're just as delicious, but w that person was never allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. And imagine if, if everybody was allowed to grow strawberries, wherever they lived, if they had the climate, the soil, the water. This, so for me, I look at this as like a reset. Mm -hmm. if, if we have different people, different cultures, balancing out the seesaw to, to cultivate food, that means that the agriculture system then evolves. Uh, we are able to potentially have a reset. But if it's if, if we're still dictating to one side 
of people saying that this is where this is going to be grown or these are the only type of people that can grow it or this is what's going to happen, then the system just keeps recycling itself over and over again. So we have a question that's coming from the audience, and I want to remind everybody, if you have any questions, we've got about 10 minutes left, so keep them coming in uh, with the hashtag Built With Biology. Um, and this question is from Kevin Costa, and it's about supply chains. With the supply chain disruptions that we're seeing around food and coming food crisis, can you foresee locally grown modes of cultivated meat on the roadmap? Might we see a microbrewery approach that would be greener, ensure equitable manufacturing and distribution? Did I accidentally plant this person in the audience? <laughs> this is a brilliant question. No, this is this has to be the way, right? So I think that model of scaling up where you're envisioning like a field of massive steel tanks in one concentrated location can't can't be the way. Like not from a risk perspective, not from getting the supply chain for that much of steel. Like we're seeing it now, like a lot of these companies that I've been chatting to, like my compatriots, we're like all building our demo facilities, pilot facilities, and facing supply chain constraints for the vessels. And having that really high yield allows you to scale out rather than scale up. This meat should never be flown around. That makes no sense. Right? Yeah. It has to be those like small microbreweries that are attached to cities, and that's what helps address the volatility points that Amy's bringing up. And more importantly, the access that you're bringing yeah, up. Yeah, I make Jayden. jokes all yeah. the time, people in Midtown, New York. What's going to happen in these buildings? I'm like, it's going to be vertical farms. They're like, what do you mean vertical farms? Like the hydroponic bib lettuce? I'm like, yeah, but there'll be meat, there'll be fish, right? Because these buildings will evolve and something will happen to them. And people think I'm crazy, but that's what's going to happen, right? Barclays and Goldman Sachs and BlackRock, they might not be there anymore. It'll be you. Yeah. Well, I don't want it only to be me, though. The meat is like two trillion but I mean, dollars as a market. You yes, and your peers. you and our peer, exactly. So it's a two trillion dollar market. There's so much that needs to be produced. And when I think about like the future farmer, right? Like I don't know that many Gen Z people who want to raise like actual livestock. It's a rough business. It's a hard business with razor thin margins, you know, and really high risks. And it's kind of lonely. And so, but I know a lot of people who want to be growing cultivated meat. I mean, we're, as you said, I think you said every person and their dog. I don't think it's that many, but, you know, like, there, there, there's it, a it, fair number of people who are excited about this space. It was a joke about Ryan Bethencourt and his, <laughs> and his pet food company. I, I think all of this is... <laughs> got it, got it. But, but, like, being able to really power that, right? Yeah. And so, and I, I think about that, like, who has, as you said, this is an agricultural reset. Right, so we've done this once before with ag innovation and all of those means of production were in one place. So I think all of this is great and depending on whose numbers you look at, agricultural production hasn't evolved in either 10,000 or 14,000 years. We haven't had a substantial change. So this is long overdue. We, and all of what you're describing, both of you are describing, I think is, um, I hope happens. But I also want us to be thinking through what are the potential um, next order impacts and and what forces could be working against the success and I think about emerging economies I think about Brazil. I think about uh, India. I think about Bangladesh I think about different countries around the world that are either agrarian or whose GDP to some degree relies on current production and also in Brazil places like Brazil where there's inconceivably still not enough broadband coverage um, so you know this potentially causes negative impact, even though it's better for the planet, it's better for people. So these are addressable problems now. Again, I think that's why we're all here, mm -hmm. so that we have the conversations today, we get the ears of our leaders, our lawmakers, to, to start having the conversations to create the conditions where what you guys are describing um, is, is helpful. It solves our problems. Mm -hmm. but, but my concern, as always, is that we just keep waiting. Like, we're, these conversations that are so vital and the work that you guys are doing doesn't bubble up beyond. And well, then that, we. Well, that's what I was saying about Nyman Ranch and Purdue, right? Nyman Ranch bought a stake in a, I mean, Purdue bought a stake in a Nyman Ranch farm. They let Nyman Ranch teach them how to raise chickens better. But in, and this is something that just came to my mind right now. It, why can't the same farmer that's growing, I'm just using hogs or mm -hmm. cattle, 
also cultivate me on the yeah. same on the same land. So upskilling. I mean, this is the thing. Like, no, that's why we're all here. But like. We got to focus some efforts. But it's, it's really interesting uh, to look at the country of Singapore. And Chef JJ, I know that you've uh, cooked in Singapore. Um, Nia, you had a company in Singapore. You still have a I still have a company, company in Singapore. In Singapore. <laughs> yeah. I actually lived in Singapore as well. So it's a very small country. Uh, hardly any farmland at all. It doesn't make sense to have farmland. Um, so it's happening in these places with governments like Singapore, very small and nimble, can, can move on a dime. And Nia, with your potential technology for creating these microbreweries, um, it seems like it, it is emerging and it is going to grow. Um, JJ, I'm wondering if you had a, uh, or when you have a field trip opening up at uh, Changi Airport. Yeah, if I, have a field trip, if I have a field trip in Singapore, everybody's coming. To <laughs> so when you have it, um, could you imagine having, you know, you walk down any high street in, uh, in America and you see a microbrewery, those beautiful gleaming... I, I think that I think that's a great way to introduce it to chefs, right? Chefs always want to be locale, right? They always want to find the best farmer to give them the best product, right? At that moment, the closest to the restaurant. And when I look at field trip and I go ho hopefully going to new markets, I'm like, well, what will that field trip have that's different than the other field trip, right? So yes, that might happen in a market like Singapore, where we're able to get cultivated meat to be on the menu and that might be the first place it is because in 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 the culture and in the community there it's accepted they've had the education they know it better so then it, it then educates us and i think that's the greatest thing about food is that food allows you to educate people it doesn't have as much bias right you can follow the history um so yes that would be something that potentially could happen if there was a field trip where i was having a different restaurant in a market like Singapore, um, you you might you might see the, you might see it on the menu. You heard it here first, and JJ, I know you <laughs> you closed your Series A uh, uh, recently. Yes, so, I have. Uh, yeah. So uh, if anybody wants to fund the Series B to scale I'm, up, I'm, if you come for a Series B, I'm coming big. So <laughs> I'm, this ain't this is not. We, we talked about this. I'm coming. I'm coming big like my peers, like the sweet greens of the world. <laughs> we have a uh, question from Christian Tillagreen. Could we unlock interesting new meats with this technology, like lion steaks and panda patties? Uh, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, y'all. <laughs> well, let's dig deeper. Hang on. I'm good being being. Uh... I, I like. Let, let's just let's just start with the basics. <laughs> so I have a I have a, but I think we shouldn't. Um, I actually think we should start uh, with, or we should include exotic meats intentionally. So again, a lot of the challenge for everybody in this room is confronting cherished beliefs. That is, that is gonna be true for every scientist, every investor, every analyst, every company. Because fundamentally, this field challenges our current cherished beliefs and our mental models. So one way to address that is to push to the edge of plausibility. So this is something that we do all the time and if you push people to the very edge of plausibility, you remove some of the psychological stress and enable everybody to get on with the conversation that you want to be having. Mm -hmm. So I would actually culture panda. And I would culture, I would make cocker spaniel kebabs. <laughs> and I would. And I would, and I personally would eat them. I would have no problem with that. I just say you got to just be careful, right? We talked about this before, right? Every, every positive, there's a negative. Right, we're talking about the ecosystem here. We're talking about being greener. We're talking about carbon neutral. We're talking about a lot of things, right? So, if we if if we're in this to make the to make this place a better place, let's not get ahead of ourselves too quickly. Well, you know, like I, I'm all about pushing the I'm I'm all about pushing the limits and bigger picture. But like we don't even know what pa what panda is even supposed to taste. But like. it doesn't it it doesn't matter because here's why. It, it doesn't matter what it tastes, and I realize I'm offending all of your sensibilities by saying it doesn't matter what any of the food tastes like, <laughs> um, because, because what this allows us to do is say, it exists, we survived. I mean, think back to Dolly the Sheep and the global freakout that ensued, right? Um, in the years since President Clinton had to call a special press conference to reassure the American people you know, we don't have demon spawn. We have therapeutics and like other ways to manufacture raw materials. It wasn't that big of a deal. That was an, that was an example of pushing to the edge of plausibility in an uncontrolled circumstance. What I'm saying is you cultivate a few weird things, 
You are pushing people to the edge of plausibility. You are showing them that it's not unsafe. And that opens up their minds now to, well, it's just cultured chicken. What were we so upset what about? You're, what you're talking about is like an art project or a research project. It's all about like what calories are you putting in? And like hopefully the, the calories we're putting in, the energy is behind where there's a problem, like where there's a pain point. And like what I try to imagine like the world without cultivated meat to like just keep it, like obviously it will go on, right? Um, but the 1% will always have their meat. Right? They will create biospheres on Mars if they have to for their Wagyu cows. But like, what about everybody else? Like, What does meat look like for the other 99%? It's flying off and on their shelves. It's getting blended with soy. It's increasingly risky to eat. Um, it's just disappearing because feed crops were devastated by a bug or there was a massive drought and now we don't have meat this week. So. I'm thinking about what we're doing is solving for that average person who wants their kids to still be able to eat dumplings or try tacos. And that to me is like something that's really I'm passionate about because food is in our culture and I want to preserve that culture. And, you know, panda meat is not in that culture. Now, is, is, that the, is it the Overton window? Is that where you expand things to the extreme to then come back to the baseline? So that's I know it sounds counterintuitive, but um, again, we're dealing with rigid mental constructs. And this is going to be, you know, for those of you in pharmaceuticals, you, you already know what some of this is like. But when it comes to the, the food is, I mean, I'm, you sh food isn't just food, it's culture, it's who we are, yeah. it's identity, mm -hmm. it's, it's everything. But people don't even want to purchase, people, there's plenty of people in this room they don't even want to pay ten ninety nine a pound for organic chicken or from the chicken farmer that you read about in Time magazine that's feeding the stuff properly, right? I look at the, I, I break it down in, in the pyramid, right? 1% is at the top, I call it 101%. 1% is at the top. There's the 40 percenters and there's the 60 percenters. The 60 percenters eat at McDonald's, Burger King, and their special occasion is at Applebee's, right? The 40 percenters eat at a local restaurant for their special occasion. They eat at McDonald's, they eat at Applebee's, but they'll go to Cheesecake Factory, right? The one percent is we eat wherever we want. The best new restaurant comes out that list, we're going to that restaurant, this restaurant, that restaurant, this restaurant, right? So we also have to think about that as we're in this process is that, yeah, we put Panda on the shelf, like who's really eating Panda? The 60 percenters aren't eating Panda. They're, they barely don't want to pay $10.99 for the organic chicken, right? And that chicken might not be, now it might, even be, might not even be there. It might just be these two things. So for me, price and culture uh, is a, reflects in price in some regards. And especially when you start introducing these meats into... Um, Culture restaurants, African, Indian, uh, Asian, Asian, you know, restaurants that are saying this this meal costs ten dollars, but they should be really serving it for twenty five dollars, but nobody wants to pay for it. Now they have to do that. So there's so much mental, as you say, restraint to try to push it. But there's so much. There's so many. There's so many onion peels uh, layers to it. Like how many? I, I don't know. Like you got to peel a lot of onions back. Well, this has been the most fun panel that I've ever done. <laughs> um, if JJ Johnson doesn't want to, uh, to take up the Panda Burger, then uh, <laughs> SingaporePandaBurger.com is uh, <laughs> going to be my next, next startup. Um, this Panda, is Express pa Panda Express Redux. <laughs> Panda Express. Panda Express 2.0, yeah. You heard it here first. <laughs> This has been wonderful. Thank you for all the questions. Thank you, Nir Gupta, Chef JJ Johnson, Amy Wegg. Let's give them a huge round of applause.